I, I just want to say again, I can't thank you enough for being willing to do this John discussion with us. Um, <laughs> I hadn't quite anticipated how long it was going to be, but I should have realized, you know, all those <laughs> chapters, one a week, <laughs> plus a few. <laughs> well, and again, I, I'm sure that you'll need to miss some, but we we're thrilled that, that you, yeah. you're going to do this. It's going to be it's, fun. It's awesome. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. going to be a lot of fun. Um, so I wanted to ask, let me start off when you were younger, like for many people, they may not know that you're Eastern Orthodox. Right. Have you always been? Were you raised that? Yes. On my father's side, I'm Russian immigration. Okay. So my father's family, on both sides, his father and his mother, both came over from Russia after the revolution. Both ended up in, in the UK, in, in London, various mm -hmm. routes, whatever, ended up marrying there and so on. Um, and then my father, in fact, was ordained as a priest before I was born. So oh, I grew up okay. with my father as a priest. Yeah? Okay. My great-grandfather was sent to London as a priest back in 1926. Wow. So he was one of the first priests there after the revolution. So, yeah. so this long history in your family then? Yeah. And um, on my, um, so my father's a priest. My sister's married to a priest. And my brother is a priest monk on Mount Athos in Greece. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And on my mother's side, I'm Swiss German, and her father was a Lutheran minister in Hanover in Germany. So wow. clerical, academic on both sides. Yeah, quite, quite the pedigree there. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's, that's terrific. So, um, again, people may not know that right now you're in Aberdeen, Scotland, mm -hmm. um, yeah. but you were for years at St. Yes. Vladimir's in New York. How long were you at St. Vladimir's? 25 years. So I went up to Oxford in 1989, the same time as my to-be wife. We, we met each other there. In, we, we in fact had rooms next door to each other in the halls of residence at Pembroke College. Uh, we got married in 91. And then in 93, I was invited to go and teach at St. Vladimir's Seminary in New York. Their previous professor of patristics, Father John Meyendorf, who had been dean, he died that year. Mm. Uh, and they invited various people to come and teach for a period of time. They invited me to come for one year. So 93 to 94, we were in New York teaching at St. Vladimir's. 94 to 95, back in the United Kingdom, while they're trying other people. And then 95, we went over permanently. And so from 95 onwards, until a few weeks ago, we were living on campus uh, in New York, in the suburbs of New York. Wow. Um, tell us how, why, why Aberdeen? What, uh, what um, you know, you so I spent 25 there? years in, in St. Vladimir's teaching and growing and working there. I was ordained in 95, I was there permanently. 2001, I was ordained, I was tenured as a professor and mm -hmm. I decided the time had come for ordination. I was kind of a, uh, this is where I was going to be, this is going to teach, this is where my, my work was going to be. I served as Dean for 10 years from 2007 to 2017. Mm -hmm. So 10 years of doing that. And then you know, it, it, a feeling gradually dawned on me ever more that I could continue doing what I'm doing, but actually I'd be treading water and I really need to stretch more mm -hmm. myself in different mm -hmm. ways. Yeah? Mm -hmm. um, you know, unless you're continuing to stretch, you're not growing. If you're not growing, you're not living. <laughs> really so i need to stretch more and one clear way of doing that was to uh, change context yeah you know i had done 25 years yeah, I've, I've taught 25 years worth of students i've been ordained as a priest for what, 18 whatever years i served as dean i've done all of that but i felt that the uh, the opportunity came up of of going to aberdeen and i felt that the um, the, the challenge of a new context would make would force me to grow in other ways that wouldn't happen had I stayed there. Together, a whole bunch of other reasons, such as our parents are getting older and that, that kind of thing, which made a move back to the UK, you know, fortuitous. Right, right. And so your wife's parents, your wife's Kate. Yes, Kate. Um, and her parents are in Cornwall, Devon and okay. Cornwall. Okay. And, you know, they're also getting older. My father died about 12 years ago now. Um, my mother's still alive. She's getting older. You know, it was just time for us to come back. Sure. Well, I, Aberdeen's blessed to have you, and I That's look forward thing. to uh, to what what will happen and and how you'll be stretched and and mm -hmm. how we'll benefit from that. Uh, real quick, uh, what's your anniversary? It was just the other day, wasn't it? 
uh, oh, my wedding anniversary. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, the 1st of September. Okay, so my, I was married in 91. Oh, really? On the, <laughs> on the 7th of September. Our anniversary is in a couple of days. <laughs> so, Congratulations. Yeah, yeah, on and the it, other, it, si it, other yeah. side of the planet. And in fact, on, the 20, on our 25th wedding anniversary, our children were old enough that we could leave them at home. You know, my <laughs> eldest was whatever he was, you know, uh, 20 or something. And uh -huh. we felt confident leaving the other two at home with him, people looking after me uh, from the fire so. And we actually went to Scotland. <laughs> so for our 25th wedding anniversary four years ago, we actually spent two weeks just touring around Scotland. Uh -huh. and to, you know, going on different places. And actually my wife asked me at that time, couldn't I find a job in Scotland? <laughs> it took me it took me four years <laughs> but we got there <laughs> that's great terrific uh fun um was she, so she wasn't there during the bad weather months of scotland right no <laughs> when the rain goes sideways and <laughs> but, but actually in aberdeen we don't get that i know you are you're we on the east it. coast we're, we're on the east coast so all the bad weather gets gets dumped in the highlands yeah we're yeah that one of the sunniest places in the uk that's awesome. And, well, during the summer, during the winter, it's dark all the time. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, um, so you've written a book that has to do with the Gospel of John. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us, tell us a little bit about that. How did that come? How did that come about? Because you're a patristic scholar, and how did that come about? So I spent 25 years, my, my doctoral work was on a figure called St. Irenaeus of Lyon, writing about the year 170 to 190 AD in, in, in France, in Lyon, although okay. he in fact was from Asia Minor. So I started my doctoral work with him and I spent 25 years teaching the church fathers, the so early church theologians, you know, from Ignatius of Antioch all the way through, specializing in the early period. I, I've done a number of studies on different figures from that period, a number of books on different figures. Um, and the more I got engaged in reading them, the more I realized they're not really thinking in the way that we tend to think today. Mm -hmm. They're not reading scripture in the way that we, were, we, we today tend to read it. Mm -hmm. And uh, the relationship between theology and exegesis was much more harmonious for them than it is for us today. You know, today we tend to do theology, systematic is a complete world unto itself, scriptural exegesis is a complete world and never the twain meet. Yeah. But it wasn't like, it simply wasn't like that in the early church. Their mode of doing theology was through exegesis, hmm. primarily, really primarily with the Old Testament. What we call the Old Testament, what the apostles, the evangelists, Christ himself simply call scripture. Yeah? And it's reading the scripture to understand and proclaim who this crucified and risen Christ is. That's the, the matrix in which they're doing all of that. Mm -hmm. So uh, learning to think like that and just, just seeing how, especially Irenaeus, Origen, others all the way through Gregorius and Maximus and so on were doing all of that. Um, I, I wrote books going up to about the end of the fourth, beginning of the fifth century. Then I started going backwards again. So I became ever more convinced they're doing it differently. And I then realized if I really wanted to get to grips with it properly, I had to go back to John himself. Hmm. Yeah. Irenaeus, uh, it came from a Asia Minor. He records about how in his youth, he had sat at the feet of Polycarp, hearing everything from Polycarp and etching it into his heart, what Polycarp related about about how he had sat, Polycarp had sat, had heard from John himself, expounding everything in harmony with the scriptures. So that kind of continuity of theology, they trace back going to John. And so I wanted to go back to the Gospel of John, especially the prologue, which we do in the first couple of weeks and in a few weeks time. Um, yep. And seeing it all again, with the benefit of having read and immersed myself for two decades or more, in his immediate followers. Mm, mm. Yeah, you know, yeah. Uh, when New Testament scholars tend to talk about the reader, the reader of the gospel, or John's community, or this, what they really mean is a hypothetical constructed community, the imagined world of the reader. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, Irenaeus might be lying, maybe he never knew Polycarp, maybe Polycarp never knew John. They certainly claim that they knew all of that, and they are working in that tradition. That's a, that's a school, 
of, of flesh and blood Christians who are writing and, and expounding all of this. Mm. And that, for me, that should really give us a, a starting point of the insight into what John's doing himself. So in the book on John, um, mm. I use what I learned from my studies of the early church. I'm going to have to mention one other thing, but you know, I'm going to start talking. We're just going to get too long. <laughs> but, okay. but one other thing that's absolutely fascinating from studying the earliest period is the fact that the annual celebration of Pascha, of Easter, mm -hmm. started with a community, or they, it is primarily celebrated in the communities that follow John. Hmm. Yeah, and they celebrate on the 14th of Nisan, whatever day of the week it was, 14th of that month, whatever day of the week it was, following the gospel, and they look back to John as the one who instituted that tradition. Okay, hmm. so for them, John was primarily the one who stands, as he does in the gospel, who stands at the foot of the cross while the Lamb of God is slain. And the real sense of me described him as this is he's a high priest of the mystery. Yeah. Whereas when we tend to think about John, we tend to focus on the prologue and incarnation, the divine word becomes flesh, becomes a human being, dwelling us and all that kind of thing. We're going to get into that as we go through the program. Um, but this idea that the, the celebration of Pascha is intrinsic to that Johannine tradition and really provides a key in which to read that gospel. Mm. Yeah, that's the way that the earliest figures did it. And even later, when they talk about incarnation, they don't mean what we mean. So... I had to go back to John with all of that. I, when we first met, I took a class, a, a short one week class uh, with you and Brad Jerzak and Kenneth Tanner uh, back in late May of 2019. And the first day you came in and it had been quite an event for you just to get there in time to do the class, if you remember. <laughs> um, yeah. But you came in and you started speaking and you started just rolling out all these things about John. And I sat there and I went, okay, I've never thought of that. But as soon as you said it, I went, that's right. That's right on the, that's gotta be right. <laughs> and it just thinks just so many things, just kind of just pieces of the puzzle just kind of mm -hmm. fit for me. And it was, uh, it was a wonderful time. I, I think of when you were just saying, I think of, John 13, 1, mm -hmm. where, you know, that, that narr John is the narrator of that statement where he says, you know, so the Passover, it was about the time of the What's Passover, and Jesus knowing his time. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's all just, framed this way. It's, it's a completely, fact, the gospel, we, we're going to get into that in the coming weeks, but it's completely, it permeates the gospel yeah, yeah. Yeah, in so many different ways, and there's so many different combinations of ways and so on. So um, with a book, you know, in a sense, it's divided into three parts. The first part is this, how John was read and remembered by his earliest followers. Mm -hmm. The second part then brings that into discussion with modern scriptural exegesis of John. Yeah, and so, yeah. so bringing those two worlds together. Yeah. And in fact, the, the you know, scholarship on John has advanced hugely over recent decades in ways which lead they, they got kind of the intimation of the kind of thing I'm bringing from the first part. Mm. You know? And so it's kind of, you know, it, it, it's pulling the conclusions which are kind of already kind of there in the scholarship on John, but making it much more crystal clear. Yeah. And then taking it one step further, but in dialogue with contemporary scripture scholarship. Yeah. And then the third part of the book, my, my first degree is in philosophy, uh, especially modern continental phenomenology, <laughs> okay. all of that kind of stuff. And the third part of it was um, about 10 years ago, yeah, 10 years ago, somebody recommended that I read a, a French philosopher called Michel Henri, who's coming up with a very strong phenomenological tradition. But his last three books were really a meditation on the Gospel of John. Hmm. And they were absolutely fascinating, looking at how somebody from a completely different discipline, not historical, studies right. like I've been doing, not scriptural exegetical and modern mode of doing that, but as a philosopher reading John. Yeah. And so it occurred to me that a really cool thing to do would be to put these three different discourses into dialogue with each other. Mm. Historical scholarship, scriptural exegesis, philosophical, phenomenological reflection, all these different, if you like, readers of John, 
Hmm. Yeah. And yeah. then to try and hold them together somehow. I'm not sure if I pulled it off, but you know, <laughs> that's a huge thing to do. Three different discourses all together and treating each discourse on its own terms. Mm. Historical scholarship, according to historical scholarship, exegesis, according to exegesis, but putting those together. And then the phenomenological chapter. I mean, you, you, you've read through it. It's difficult. <laughs> it's yeah, really yeah. difficult. Yeah. But you can see he's getting to the same kind of insights reading John as I got from the first two parts. Mm. And so that was just, I just had to include that. And then trying to put them all together as an act of theology. Yeah, you know, theology, you've got all these different disciplines in theology, historical study, scriptural study, uh, systematic reflection, all that kind of thing. But what holds it together as a singular theology? That's what I was trying to get to. Yeah, so I'm doing each discipline according to the canons of its own discipline, but then holding it together. Um, I'm not yeah. sure that we're going to be bringing Michel Henri much into the, the coming <laughs> weeks. Uh, that's, a, that's a world apart in all of that. <laughs> but maybe from time to time he might make an appearance. Okay, great. <laughs> That'd be great. So um, tell, me, tell us real quickly uh, what, you're, what you'll be doing at Aberdeen, like what you'll be teaching. And what projects are you working on currently? So, so, so my, my, my main role in teaching is historical theology. Okay. So my main role in teaching is historical theology and doctoral students. Yeah, I've got okay. about an eight or nine doctoral students starting with me this autumn, this fall, doing everything from the Gospel of John, the Apocalypse, to Maximus Confessor, doing all sorts of really interesting stuff. Oh. Uh, that's just I haven't had doctoral students before, so I'm really looking forward to that. Oh, that sounds fun. Yeah. Um, currently, I'm, I'm just finishing off a new critical edition and translation of a work by Gregory of Nyssa on the human being, <coughs> which I'm doing with a view to my next, the next book I want to write. This is a, a text of translation introduction. Yeah, that's one thing. Okay. Um, also, but this is long term doing a new edition and translation of Irenaeus with a friend and former student of mine. That's probably mm. a 10 year project. But the reason I'm doing the one on Greg of Nyssa is because I really want to write a book. This will be my next book and I've got the title and I think it's coming together in my mind. And mm. the title is The Lamb, The Bride and The Marriage Feast. Christology, Ecclesiology, Anthropology. Wow. Yeah, okay. so the Lamb, well, that's primarily the Gospel of John, the yeah. crucified and risen Lord, um, and really, in a sense, all of theology and all of the liturgical year in liturgical traditions, they are a refraction or an exposition of this central Paschal event. Okay, that's that part. Mm -hmm. The bride pairing with ecclesiology, the bride, the... the, the uh, the woman in the apocalypse, yeah, giving mm. birth to the son, um, understanding that as a church, and you've got so much material in the early church about the, the church is our mother in whose womb we are born as living children of God by taking up the cross by following Christ and so on. The, the, the man, the bride, ecclesiology. And then the resultant of that is the marriage feast, which I would equate with anthropology, the human being. Mm. Yeah, we're to become human, as Ignatius says, and I think following John. Yeah, Christ saying on the cross, it is finished. As we'll find out, I think it's referring to uh, back to Genesis, let us make a human being, it's finished, here's a human being. So the marriage yeah. feast of, of yeah. you know, <laughs> the uncreated and created here is the human being. So, uh, sounds awesome. And, sounds and awesome. ultimately, it's God being all in all which you actually have reflection on the early church, well, actually with Maximus, that the, the result of all of that is one, one human being. <laughs> yeah, the, whole, the whole of creation becomes like one human being. Uh, yeah, and so, so many things with that. <laughs> oh, yeah, I've got questions already. But I'm not gonna <laughs> hold them. Spinning, yeah. <laughs> that's right, I'm going to hold them. I'm going to hold them. Uh, that, that sounds awesome. Um, Last question I, I wanted to, to just throw out. <clears throat> um, 
So in the coming weeks, we're going to obviously be exploring and discussing John. Um, and uh, you've, you've answered, part of my question was in reference to why, John, you've already, you've already addressed that. You've answered that. Um, so the second part would be probably just more of, on a personal side, what, uh, I'm not sure how I want to frame this. What about John uh, personally? Yeah, you know, let, let me simplify it. What, what would be your favorite perspectives or dimensions of John? I mean, I here here's where I'm getting at. I remember um, <clears throat> when I was a kid because I grew up in a in a, a religious home and. I remember my, uh, the first time I ever decided I would pick up a Bible and start to read it, mm -hmm. I started reading John. Mm -hmm. And the reason why was because my name was John. And I'm yeah. looking through this book and there's a, there's a, there's a title. Of one. Yeah. <laughs> That's why I'm going to read this one. And I, I always loved it. I, from the day I read the book of John, I've always loved the book of John. And uh, but there were certain things about it. One of them for me that was a, was a kind of an aha moment was at the, en at the end, John is one of those few pieces of literature where he, he says, this is why I wrote. Yeah. And then we, we debate and argue over why he wrote. <laughs> but the phrase, the phrase that he uses there, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, is out of the lips of Martha back in, ele back in chapter 11, right? Yeah. When he, before mm -hmm. he raises Lazarus from the dead. The same exact phrase. And, and then she says, uh, I believe you're the coming one. Mm -hmm. after, after she says that phrase. And I, I just thought, oh my gosh, this is, this is, this is huge. This is yeah. big. I don't even know how big, but it's big. Yeah. So that's something for me that's always excited me and has, has unfolded over the years in, in my life and in, in, in just many ways. So I guess that's what I was, was kind of thinking, like what are, what are the things about or something about John for you like that? Um, I think it could be several things I'm going to answer to this. Uh, yeah. First of all, it is just simply beautiful prose. Yeah. yeah. The, the, and especially in Greek, the language is just beautiful. Um, and it's full of things which are kind of self-referential or picking up on different things and making you think and making you make connections. It, it kind of forces you to do that. Yeah. Mm. Um, in a way that the synoptics don't really do. Mm. Okay. So a second thing would be the difference with the synoptics. Yeah, and it really is, it, it is so, it's not just kind of a variant on the same, yeah, mm -hmm. you know, in the way that, I know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they're variants on the, Matthew, Mark, Luke, they're variants on the same. John is really quite something different. And the way I char would characterize that is that um, in the Synoptic Gospels, the disciples really don't know who he is until the end, mm -hmm. okay? Same is true in John, but it's slightly differently. And it's really, you know, on the road to Emmaus, the scriptures are open, the bread is broken, Christ shows to him from the, to the disciples on the road to Emmaus from the scriptures that Moses and all the prophets wrote about me, how I had to suffer. Yeah. But you've got that right at the very beginning of John with the discourse between Philip and Nathaniel. You know, we found the one of whom Moses speaks right there mm -hmm. in the first chapter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We found the one of whom Moses speaks. Um, you know, you, you, Rabbi, you're the king of Israel. Yeah, you, you've got all of that right within a handful of verses. And then, G, and then Jesus says, you think that's great? I'm going to show you greater things than that. The heavens will be open and you'll see the, the, the angels ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Yeah, so you, you've got the very beginning of the, of the gospel. The gospel really starts where the other gospels finish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 
you know, they get to that at the end, the scriptures are open and they now start to make the connection. John is basically saying, no, you're still taking it in too low a sense. Mm. Yeah, you've got to take it on a higher level. It's not just the one about who most, but it's a son of man himself with the angels ascending and descending upon him, hearkening back to, you know, Jacob's ladder and so on. Um, although, where is that description of where, the, where you will see the son of man uh, with the angels ascending? The heavens open the son of man. Where is that in the gospel? Yeah. And then also it's another question. Like, why are the angels ascending and descending? Why aren't they, don't angels descend before they ascend? What, what's, yeah, what, what on earth is going on with that? And then the other mentions of the son of man, the gospel of John play upon that in all sorts of ways. So he's taking up the reflection on a wholly different level. Um, and the most, probably the most graphic example of that is the fact that in the Gospel of John, Christ is always in control. You know, the wedding of Cana, mm. now is not my time, when I'm ready, mm. yeah? All the way yeah, through, yeah. Now is not, when I'm ready, then I will go to the cross, yeah? Even to the point, really, there's kind of a, uh, John makes Christ say completely different to, to the synoptics. Mm. In the synoptics, in Gethsemane, Christ is there sweating blood, you know, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. In the Gospel of John, Christ actually says, what, should I say let this cup pass from me? Right. No, oh. for this reason I've come. Yeah. Yeah. What I was going to say, the third thing I'd want to say, uh -huh. and this is one which is, you know, I'm still digesting and working on, is to take seriously the Gospel of John and the, Revelation, the, the Apocalypse as being by the same person, hmm. which... The disciples of John, all the way through to Irenaeus, were totally convinced it's by the same person. Mm. Yeah. And then what is the relationship between the gospel and the apocalypse? Because of the way we've got it now in our New Testament, we finish John and we start reading the book of Acts. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, Acts was not written to continue John. Or John wasn't written to precede Acts. Luke right. and Acts go together. Yeah. yeah? And yeah. so reading John followed by Acts, followed by Ascension and Pentecost, is not, doesn't work. If you're, to do, if you're to pair it with anything, it would be with the apocalypse. Yeah? And the way I would put it is that both Gospels are written by the same figure standing at the same place, hmm. but told in two different registers. The Gospel is written by the one who stands at the foot of the cross, whose witness is true, as it says, yeah, mm -hmm. um, and is, is describing it on that register, the apocalypse is written by the one who's standing for the enthroned lamb. And it's the same John standing in the same place, mm. yeah, but telling the description in two different registers. That's awesome. I, I think, I have a theory. I think uh, the people who put our... New Testament together was a librarian. <laughs> yes, almost certainly. <laughs> well, right. you know, the, uh, Acts became detached from Luke's and the four Gospels yeah. became gathered together and we've got manuscripts yeah. preserving the four <laughs> Gospels, but, but they are not written that way. Yeah? Right, you know, right, so you, right. So yeah, and everybody until the mid-third century took it for granted that the Apocalypse is written by the same person who wrote the Gospel. Hmm. Yeah. That's great. So if, if you just take that, it, it opens up so many other uh, perspectives and avenues. But that, that would have to wait for my book on the Lamb, the Bride, and the Marriage Feast. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've, I'm looking forward to it very much. Okay. So, well, thank you. Thank you for your time. I know it's late there. And um, oh. 